Okay, no PowerPoint for me. So um, I am really thrilled to be presenting with mis viejas amigas. A, uh, I've learned a lot from them. But even though I'm going to talk about the history, I want you to know that um, this is kind of history that has been informed by the present and the work that I'm doing with young people. Uh, they have helped me see that um, I'm, I romanticize about the past in ways that I shouldn't. So uh, this is a, a, an old lens, but through a young lens, I hope. Um, and I, I want to talk about the Bilingual Education Act as a way of taming the communities and the tongues. Um, and what I want to argue is that the Bilingual Education Act was really never meant to fully support biling a bilingual Latinx community that really struggled uh, for equitable and fair education that confronted the racism that they were experiencing and the structural inequalities. Um, so to do that, I want to do three things. I want to review some of the historical context in which the Bilingual Education Act was passed and paying particular attention to the struggles of the community uh, in an era that I call power to the people. And then uh, talk about the institutionalization of bilingual education through the Bilingual Education Act as a way to control that space uh, for, uh, for the community's wishes and a mechanism just to teach English through a discourse of pride in being bilingual. Uh, and this is uh, the era that I called uh, going from power to the people to pride in the people, um, and maybe talking about it as a liberal, multicultural, bilingual education. And then just to frame it for everybody else, uh, to uh, remind us that in the absence of the Bilingual Education Act, because it certainly hasn't been 50 years, it started a long time ago, and it ended maybe a long time ago also, um, the idea that it has really lost a connection to the Latinx community, uh, serving mostly the interests of English-speaking white majorities, and commodifying bilingualism for profit only, an era that I called the neoliberal dual language education. So going from power to the people to pride in the people, and a, and a liberal multicultural bilingual education to a neoliberal dual language education that doesn't even uh, name its own bilingualism. So let me just remind you uh, the context in which the Bilingual Education Act was passed in 1968. The Vietnam War was on, the Malay massacre had occurred in March, uh, Martin Luther King was assassinated in, in April, Robert Kennedy in June, uh, the Democratic Convention in Chicago, the police came in in August, and um, because I'm presenting with only Latina Amigas, uh, a reminder that this was also the year in which uh, the freedom trash cans in the Miss America pageant were full of uh, bras and mops and things like that as the women's liberation movement movement took on. Uh, so it's important to contextualize the Bilingual Education Act in that era. Um, in, I spoke yesterday about this in New York City, so I'm going to go to the Southwest, which is not my territory, but certainly the uh, El Movimiento, the Chicano Civil Rights Movement, has to be recognized uh, in these efforts. Uh, the uh, rights for farm workers not only claimed the land, but also education reform. In Los Angeles in 1968, over 15,000 Chicano students, faculty, and community members walked out of seven East uh, Los Angeles high schools, and their demands were those that we are familiar with. Bilingual, bicultural education, administration, and teachers who show any form of prejudice toward Mexican or Mexican-American students will be removed Moved, and textbooks and curriculum will be developed to show Mexican me and Mexican American contribution. Um, and the Brown Berets, um, uh, known earlier as the Young Chicanos for Community Action, uh, who were really dedicated to confronting the racism that the community was experiencing the then, um, the t their 10 point program included 
the demand, they're demanding uh, the right to bilingual education as guaranteed under the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, but they also demanded with, you know, as, uh, alongside bilingual education that the history of Mexican Americans be taught, that police officers, that there should be a civilian police review board so that the police officers would be screened, uh, that the officers in Mexican American communities have to live in the community and speak Spanish, uh, the end to urban renewal programs that replace our barrios with high rent homes for middle class people, so, uh, and the right to vote also if you didn't speak English. So bilingual education was part of a, a package of uh, um, measures that were needed for the community. And then the Bilingual Education Act was passed in 1968. Uh, and my, my argument is that it was passed to control this civil unrest. And that what we did was we took it as a way to just improve the self-esteem of the uh, community and instill cultural pride. But we divorced it from the broader political struggles and reframed it just as a compensatory program for linguistically deficient students. So um, uh, Senator Yarborough, whom uh, Oscar introduced earlier in 1967, when he was introducing the legislation to Senate, said that monolingual schooling had caused great psychological harm to bilingual children and contributed to their poor for performance in school and their high dropout rates. So the emphasis now became the improvement of uh, their, their self-esteem, uh, so because monolingual education had caused psychological harm. And certainly when Lyndon Johnson signed it on January 2nd, 1968, he said that bilingual education will give a better start, a better chance in school uh, to um, children. So it, this, the emphasis became now just instilling pride so that students do better in school. Um, so it's important to understand what happened through the reauthorizations. In 1968, the funds, even though they were uh, very scant, as Oscar has mentioned, were given for instruction in what they called imaginative programs. The community was free to imagine what bilingual education for their community uh, should mean, but eventually it became bureaucratized, right? So in 1974, it was then defined as transitional. 1980, Reagan comes, and as Tuscar says, he says that it's absolutely wrong and against American concepts to have bilingual education that is openly dedicated to preserving their students' uh, native language. So, um, so things start to change. The 1984 reauthorization for the very first time uh, allowed funding for English-only programs through a bilingual education act that had meant to support bilingual education. And this is an important shift because at the beginning they had a quota for these English-only programs, but by 1994 reauthorization, the last time that the act was reauthorized, that quota was lifted and attention began to be paid to what was then called two-way immersion programs. And so we come to the era that we're in, and an era that um, I think we are uh, starting to see uh, some cracks in what has been given to us, but certainly the end of the Bilingual Education Act in 2002 uh, with No Child Left Behind, and the disappearance of bilingual education as, uh, or the word bilingual in legislation, uh, transferring it to this Title III, which is called English Language Acquisition, Language Enhancement, and Academic Achievement Act. No mention of bilingualism. And the bilingual education profession itself, in, a, in an effort to survive, then shifted even the naming of the profession to dual language education. So uh, we have to remember what is happening. But in its doing, I think we have also entered this era of neoliberal dual language education that I think Guadalupe Valdez cautioned us about many years ago and continues to caution us. 
I have seen it. I'm, uh, I've been at it for a long time. I remind you, for example, of PS 192, a school that I worked with from the 1980s on very, very closely, uh, a, a school that was um, 95% Latino first, Puerto Rican, then Dominican mostly, um, with a principal who was Puerto Rican who was very devoted, Alex Rodriguez, with a door that was open to the community, with mothers who came into the school uh, to take classes in civics, in GED, in citizenship, in ESL. So there was, uh, and, and they also gave classes in sewing, in cake baking, in all kinds of things. So this incredible community school um, where everybody was treated as familias, uh, and where everybody was bilingue, then and with a sense of this is, Pride, you know, I, I complained yesterday that the bilingual education session of New York City was put in the basement two floors down, and I have an article with uh, Nelson Flores, which was called "From the Basements to the Boutiques," because in the ba uh, these programs were usually located in the basements, but yet there was tremendous pride, right? I mean, this is th the things that I've heard. Los nenes están contentos, los maestros también. Ahora entienden, saben mucho, todos participan. So a sense of real pride in the in the children. Well, 192 now, PS 192 now advertises itself not as being in Harlem, but as, as being in Hamilton Heights. And uh, if you look the, at the website, which of course we didn't have one when uh, the era that I'm talking about, um, it says something like students will show measurable growth in reading and math resulting from the school-wide implementation of systems and structures that support instructional focus. And that's it. Uh, now, the community hasn't changed. It's still mostly Latino, but they only offer ESL. And this is interesting to me because what is happening then is that in these communities, uh, these are the kids that are being excluded from bilingual education programs, from the dual language programs that we have created in some cities um, with more um, rigidity than in others. So it's not the same in different parts of the country, but certainly in New York City it's become a very rigidly two-way where 50% of the kids have to be of one kind, 50% of the kids have to be in another of the other kind. And this of course leads to lots of kids being excluded and in places where there are a lot of, uh, of uh, language minoritized children, uh, no bilingual education at all. So we get to the state uh, stage that we're in uh, where dual language education is often seen as just bilingualism for profit with these boutique programs where some kids are excluded, where everybody can shop, uh, with, with an educational marketplace where we have a range of choices, and yet there's no mention of bilingualism, and many of our kids are excluded. They're excluded because in making room for fit, the way that has been interpreted uh, in some places, ma in making room for 50% of white students uh, are racialized children, uh, and those who uh, have poor performances are excluded. So what I want to leave you with is this idea that, to me, the bilingual education's failure had to do, and continues to have to do, with the lack of attention to the broader structural barriers that confronted and continue to confront Latinx communities and the, under, the underestimation that the Bilingual Education Act had of the continuing legacy of institutional racism and the material inequalities that have shaped and continue to shape the lives of Latinx students. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Kathy Escamilla, and I'm from the University of Colorado at Boulder. And um, I always, I guess, had a, a pronoun problem, uh, because I don't consider myself one in a million. I consider myself one of a million <laughs> of people like me who grew up in the era of the Bilingual Education Act. And so um, I have to thank Oscar for convening this panel and thank him for the opportunity to relive the past 50 years, which is a little bit hard, I think, to uh, summarize into the last 10 minutes, uh, but uh, into the next 10 minutes, but I, I'm going to try. Um, as we have said already in, um, on January 2nd, 1968, President Johnson assigned into law that something called the Bilingual Education Act. I, I'm reading this quote from him just so we see the language of the time and see that thankfully language has evolved a little bit over the last 50 years. Um, the bill contains a special provision establishing bilingual education programs for children whose first language is not English. Thousands of children of Latin descent Young Indians and others will get a better start, a better chance in school. We have begun a campaign to unlock the full potential of every boy and girl, regardless of his race or his religion or his father's income, emphasis mine. But you see the language of, of the times. Um, now, uh, we tend to, and you can look at just about every single textbook that any of us have read in graduate school and see this as the history of, of bilingual education and see this, this is where it starts with uh, President Johnson and uh, Senator Ralph Yarborough of Texas. Um, however, little noted or not well enough noted are the many local and state leaders who also contributed to this movement in communities such as mine in Colorado. So in the left-hand corner there you see Rudolfo Corky Gonzalez who led a, uh, something in Denver called the Crusade for Justice. And um, well before the Bilingual Education Act, he was saying that it might be helpful to teach young children coming to school speaking Spanish, Spanish, while they were learning English, so that they wouldn't, um, at the language of the time, get behind in content areas while they were learning English. Um, the this, uh, next slide down there, you see a gentleman called Jose, uh, his name is Jose Angel Gutierrez, and Jose was in Crystal City, Texas. He led a boycott in the 1960s before the Bilingual Education Act for bilingual education for children in that city. Um, in the middle there, you see Ricardo Fernandez. Thanks to Ricardo Fernandez from Wisconsin. Wisconsin still has one of the only bilingual education acts in the country that, that calls for um, maintenance bilingual education programs. Um, I, I'm saying all of this because I don't think that my students read enough about this history when we read about the history of the Bilingual Education Act. We think of it as some sort of a federal mandate and not all of the local and state leaders. Um, the, uh, the, woman, the woman down kind of at the bottom, her name is Evelina uh, Lopez Antonetti, right? She's from here in New York, and she led a similar kind of movement for Puerto Ricans. At the same time, all of this was happening at the same time. Um, over at the far right is a dear friend of mine. Her name is Marta Urioste. She founded a group of people in Denver called the, G the um, Congress for Hispanic Educators, CHE. Um, they had a court case from 1968 that continues to this day, and Marta continues to be the president of the Congress for Hispanic Educators. So the Bilingual Education Act um, happened, and we're grateful for it, uh, but it didn't happen just because President Johnson and Ralph Yarborough decided it was a good idea. There were, there were a whole lot of other things, as Ophelia mentioned. There was a, a civil rights movement ahead. Now, the next uh, few minutes that I have, this uh, paper is going to be uh, part his not even historical analysis, part historical recounting, and a lot autoethnography, because um, it was in 1971 that I started my career as a bilingual teacher. And so I'm going to um, interject with that how much enthusiasm people of my generation had for this field, but how little knowledge we actually had, uh, particularly around pedagogy. So we, we made up in activism and enthusiasm for what we lacked in how to teach kids to read. Um, and uh, that, I think, continues to plague us to, to this day a little bit. Okay, so um, 
the inspiration for the Bilingual Education Act, as I learned, not until, not in 1968, I learned in 1984 when we moved to Tucson, Arizona, came from a report called the Invisible Minority Report, which was uh, released by the National Education Association in 1966. And the reason I didn't learn about it until um, 1984 was because the people who were part of writing the report, the names like Maria Urquides and Adalberto Guerrero, and Hank Oyama said, we wrote the report, we gave it to the feds, and we never got any credit for it. Uh, now, what they said when they re released this report was a survey in the Southwest of um, the state of education for Spanish-speaking kids. And the report released was called the Invisible Minority Report, Pero No Vencibles. And that's important because somehow the Spanish subtitle got left off of the report when it was published. Um, now, what they concluded was something that I think we could argue is as relevant in 2018 as it was in 1966. Um, there were 1.75 million children who speak Spanish as a mother tongue. There are many more now, but um, the issue is still relevant. They're concentrated in the states of Arizona, California, Texas, New Mexico, and Colorado. Although we know there's been a great diaspora, there's still a heavy concentration of Spanish-speaking kids. Uh, the majority of Spanish-speaking kids in these states experience academic failure. Does this read like a report that could have been released yesterday? Um, they are for frequently punished at school for speaking Spanish or forbidden from using Spanish, and sadly that's still true in too many schools across the, the country. Um, a very large percentage of these students drop out of school, and the majority are U.S. citizens. In 2018, almost upwards of 80% of the kids who are Spanish-speaking who enter U.S. schools were born in the United States. They're U.S. citizens. Um, okay, so it is the the report had two recommendations. Oops, you have a faster computer than I do, Oscar. Okay, um, the two recommendations were to develop and implement bilingual education programs, um, to develop and implement and to develop and implement educational programs that honor and value students' cult culture, heritage, and language. That's wonderful. Who who at the time, um, who was of my age, could argue with that. Um, now, from what they say, entre dicho y hecho, that, that was where the problem was. What does that mean? How do we do it? Um, where do we get people who know how to do it? Um, around that time, um, two researchers at the University of Texas in Austin, Anderson and Boyer, uh, released a report that basically said the same thing as the Invisible Minorities Act. Um, that a child's mother tongue is an essential part, um, not, in, not just of his or her identity, but it's the best instrument for learning, especially in the early stages. Now, again, if you read this, um, what this was was a vision. It, it doesn't read to me like the deficit uh, paradigms that we ended up with and have lived with over the past 50 years. It, in many ways, it was an asset-based paradigm. Um, how it got translated is and put into practice is something else, and we all know about that. Okay, so um, in 1971, um, I graduated from college, not that that would be a lot of interest to you, but um, <laughs> as many, as many um, young people of my era, um, there was a flood of teachers on the market. I was a Spanish literature major, and I wanted to teach people about Unamuno and Pablo Neruda. Um, I mean, that was my vision. And I ended up working in a migrant summer school in Johnstown, Colorado. And um, they got funded, they, we were the second funded bilingual education education program in the state of Colorado. Uh, and the principal was looking for teachers. And so he pulled me aside, the principal of the school pulled me aside and said, um, would you like to teach here? And I said, well, I don't have any elementary credentials. I haven't seen a six-year-old since I was six. <laughs> and, he said, and he said to me, and I will never ever forget this because it does represent, I think, where we were when we started this. He said, honey, because you could call people honey, the honey, if you can cut and paste and teach and speak Mexican, you can teach at our school. It was a very um, kind of, um, what do I want to say? They were mixed messages because the director of the bilingual program said to me, 
Kathy, this is the future. You are investing in the future. Everyone's going to be bilingual. This, so there were mixed messages in the school is what I want to say. I have a picture. That's the picture of the school. The picture of the telephone is the telephone right outside of the school office that said speak English only on this phone. Um, so it was in that. So I, want to, I wish I had had a voice for advocacy. I wish I had a preparation for being a teacher. I wish we had a pedagogy. We had enthusiasm. And I, I just would like to say, I'm not trying to be self-deprecating. Um, we became a model school. People from all over Colorado came to visit our school. Why, I don't quite know. And I'm not, and I'm not going to be funny, other than we were doing this experiment called bilingual education. And um, we were supposed to get training to do that, there was no local university where we could get uh, preparation. So as going back to, to the facts, the original Bilingual Education Act did not require schools to use any language other than English. We were on our own to figure out what we wanted to do. Um, there was no funding ap appropriated. When I started working in 1971, our school was a funded Title VII program. Um, I'm going to skip over some of the things that people have said. Um, in 1974, however, which was years after the first act, was the first time that there was mandated teacher preparation funds included. So for years and years, we had people like me teaching without credentials and no place to go and get a credential. It wasn't that we didn't want to know more. It was 1978 until we decided that maybe research might be important. That if we did some research, we might figure out better what to do. Um, and I, particularly, again, we had the vision that the, the powerful rationale was set out in 1968. What we had, didn't have was a way to really translate that into good practice. Um, in my journey from 1975 to 1978, um, I married and I m we moved to Southern California. And my second job in a Title VII funded program for the Bilingual Education Act was in the landing pattern of LAX. So I went from teaching migrant kids in Colorado to Lenox, California, which was in the landing pattern of LAX. Uh, all of us, since I was one of the few teachers that had experience and I had managed to get myself a bilingual credential, I was the Spanish reading specialist. I I had never taken a class in methods of teaching reading in Spanish. And again, I am one of a million. That's why I'm calling this an autoethnography. I am just one of many of us who had, who had interest, who loved working in the schools and with children, but did not have the formal preparation. I ended up being a curriculum developer. I, I get, got called to Washington to read proposals to decide who else should get a, a bilingual uh, a grant. And I was the language assessment coordinator. Now, this was the year the government decided that we had to divide kids into NEP, LEP, and FEP. And I say that because all of a sudden I ended up tr having to decide for our school whether we use the language assessment scales to decide who was a NEP or a LEP or the bilingual syntax measure. Now, as bad as all these uh, measures were, I, I will say two things. Um, one, we haven't, um, we haven't evolved because those were five point scales. <laughs> We're still using five or six point scales to decide who's NEP or LEP or FEP. And the difference between these two instruments and the ones that we're using now is that the bilingual syntax measure was available in five languages and the instruments we're using now are available in English only. So um, in some ways, you know, they, what, is the, what do they say? Um, time passes um, and Every reauthorization, with the exception of 1994, every reauthorization has been more English-leaning and less bilingual-leaning. And we all know, as, as a couple of people have said, that the act disappeared in 2001 with the passage of No Child Left Behind. Um, but we basically, what is the legacy? Um, are emerging, how are emerging bilingual kids served? How many are there? Where are they concentrated? What languages do they speak? Surprisingly, if you go on any of the, the, ba the big um, places where we're supposed to have databases, you cannot find this information. Um, I'm going to show you quickly. This is a map of the United States. You know that. Um, that my, there's an interactive map that you can click on to the National Clearinghouse for Language Acquisition. And if you click on any state, it will give you information about what are called English learners in the state. And if you, if you ask again what kind of programs they're served in, you'll get a list of something that looks like this. 
that says dual language, yes, bilingual, yes, transitional, yes, but it doesn't tell you how many kids are served in that particular program or what languages are used or how they're used, so the information is largely not useful. Um, finally, since my time is out, I did, in preparation for this uh, report, a look at all of the abstracts for the National Professional <laughs> Development Programs. These are the ones that prepare teachers, and this is my interest, because I felt so woefully underprepared when I became a bilingual teacher that I've been interested in how we're preparing teachers. You, this year, to, or last year, 2017, there were 42 awards per, uh, given to 23 states. Notice that 41% of all of the awards went to programs that were doing English as a second language and not any form of bilingual education, dual language or otherwise. Um, notice that 51% of the money went for in-service teacher preparation, which leads me to believe we're not much farther ahead than when I was a teacher in 1971, because mostly half or more than half of the teachers were graduating are not teachers who are prepared to do the work that we need to do. Um, languages, um, while it, there's, there were several programs um, in Spanish, um, in 1971 uh, there were programs in 26 different languages funded, uh, and now there's Spanish and there was one Hawaiian program, but that was to develop English as uh, ELD, English Language Development, for Hawaiian natives teachers and not a bilingual program. So we need to keep the dream alive. We have a lot of work to do. And I hate to end on a negative note, but the more things change, the more they stay the same. Thank you very much. I'm not seeing the presenter view. <laughs> okay, there we go. Thank you very much. And um, it's, it's what you presented is a great a segue to what I'm going to be talking about because in all of these ebbs and flows as far as policy and politics, um, one of the things that we have neglected, you know, you know, far too often is what's happening with bilingual teacher preparation. Case in point, right now in California, Proposition 58 just passed, and all of a sudden, uh, superintendents and principals are calling up. We need so many teachers, and it's like, well, guess what? <laughs> we don't have them uh, because that proposition just passed last year. So we're really working hard to to prepare as many teachers. But again, uh, we will not compromise the quality of the preparation of teachers, especially not now. Um, so just, just to go back um, very, very quickly, this has already been covered, but I, the key point here in bilingual teacher uh, education is the movement. As, as all of these policies and everything is happening, what has happened with bilingual education and I, uh, teacher preparation, and I think that's what Kathy uh, left us with right now. And, and it wasn't until we finally started to get some kind of federal funding to, to really pay attention to this area that we started to um, develop these uh, bilingual teacher preparation programs. So, so you know, back in, um, in 1974, so we said, okay, we have bilingual education, so districts were looking at how do we develop these programs, and that was a perfect example of what was happening throughout the nation is, okay, do you, are you bilingual? You know, all we need is, you know, let, let's put you, I, I remember my first grade classroom, it was an empty classroom, and they just said, just figure it out. No materials. I learned to play the guitar that, that year, because I figured, okay, we'll teach songs, we'll sing, you know, and then, and then we'll decode the songs. Or, uh, but we were kind of left to our, to our own uh, devices to figure it out. So, so we started to look at you know, bilingual education program development, uh, looking at uh, development of specialized uh, curriculum. Um, and then also looking at developing bilingual education professional development or learning communities. In institutions of higher education, what was happening is we didn't really have the, um, the bilingual faculty, which is still an issue right now. You know, you, know, you, know, you fast forward 20 years and we're still dealing with the same thing, or 30 years rather. 
Um, and, as, and then also um, we started to look at the bilingual research and said, well, we should, we should learn about this. What are we doing? What, what, are, what are the theories that are informing us? And then also looking at developing bilingual teacher preparation curriculum, uh, which is uh, the area that I've you know, spent most of my career developing is bilingual teacher education curriculum. So looking at, first of all, in institutions of higher education, the shortage of bilingual teachers and bilingual teachers that with the self-efficacy and, and really the, the confidence to be able to teach curriculum methods courses in the language, the target language. So by, so we're doing all this work and we make some headway and then what happens? Um, we start to deal, especially, you know, voters were convinced in California, Arizona, and Massachusetts that we needed to replace bilingual education and return back to um, SEI programs, you know, so English, structured English immersion programs. So then we went through this process of dismantling um, the, the few bilingual teacher education programs that existed throughout the nation. So it, it's, you know, these ebbs, it's very, very tiring. You know, so sometimes people say like, how, you know, how do, how do you keep this going? And I think that uh, because we know what is best for our students, then we go back and say, okay, let's do this again. Let, let's do, but, but let's do it better. And, and let's do it in a more informed manner. And, and, and make sure that we don't go back to situations where we're gonna go back to dismantling what we know is best for children. So, so you start looking at programs. So, so what I'm going to turn to right now is a program at San Diego State University, where I'm, um, I'm the chair and professor um, in, with this program. And we, the name of our department is Department of Dual Language and English Learner Education. But during this time, um, after after 227 passed, uh, we really struggled to exi uh, to exist, and we had become. Uh, at that time, an autonomous program. We separated ourselves from the regular school of teacher education and, because we needed to make our own decisions as to how we were going to prepare bilingual teachers. But because of 227, students stopped coming. They were saying, well, why would I need a bilingual credential when that's being outlawed? You know, no, nobody's hiring, nobody really needs that. And people were saying, well, it's good that you speak Spanish, but you don't need a bilingual credential because we don't have bilingual programs. Or, or the few that were being run, um, were, uh, they, they were self-sufficient. So we started to suffer with low enrollment, and then our faculty, who had, which at one point was very robust, and. The, they were retiring, some people passed away, some people um, you know, went off to do other things. So we ended up with very low numbers to the point that I was the only one left in our department. Mm -hmm. um, and so people would say, well, what are you gonna do? And at that point, I just, you know, so basically our office was shut down and I was the only one left. So then I said, okay, I have two choices. And, and I have, and really I had a commitment to those that came before me. Uh, some amazing colleagues that had worked very, very hard for many years to develop this program. And I had a conversation with um, a great colleague of mine, maybe some of you may know him, Dr. Alberto Ochoa. And I remember sitting in my office, and I was crying. I'm not a crier, but I, I, I cried a lot during that year because I had to make some tough decisions. Do I just go somewhere else? And I had some options of where I, what I could do, but I thought, this is too important. And he told me, Christina, if you step down, if you don't fight, to continue with this program. 30 years of collective labor and hard work will go down the drain. So I said, okay, what do I do? So um, that's when you turn to your community. That's when I uh, started to work with our, our superintendents and our principals, the, the few that still had either maybe charter schools or you know bilingual programs in the schools. And I said, do you, are you gonna continue uh, to develop your bilingual programs, your dual language programs? And they said, yes. Where do you plan to get your teachers? Well, from you guys. Well, guess what? We're being dismantled. So if you want us to continue, we are going to need you to really step up and start writing letters to the university president because at that time, our and deans of education are so so critical when you're talking about bilingual teacher preparation. At that time, that, that, um, that dean was telling me, um, we can't afford to run this program anymore. It's just you, and you have very low numbers now. And so I had a few lectures that were still with me. And I said, you can't afford to not run this program. I said, and I'm gonna make sure that we continue. So I made it my, you know, for five years, basically that's what I was doing. But the letters came in, the community spoke, 
And then I went to the University Senate and we were voted that we, were, we would be able to continue because that we were gonna meet the needs of the, of the community. So we reemerged. We reemerged and um, were able to continue. Um, hired five new, you know, some more faculty. Um, and uh, we, in fact, just right now, we hired two more. We have another call coming up because uh, we are we're booming now. You know, students are there, and um, and we're we're just we're very excited because we're moving forward. But now, of course, the legislation has passed Proposition 58. You know, all of these programs are growing. And once again, we have a shortage of bilingual. We, we don't even, ha we're not even producing enough for our county. And we have people from all over the state um, that need um, bilingual teachers. So now we also uh, end up with a shortage of bilingual faculty. You know, we, uh, there are very few um, bilingual faculty. And probably most of them are sitting here today. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so, so a lot of work needs to be done, and I think what you were talking about, as far as you know, the, the Title VII grants that we used to get, and uh, and just ways to support so that we can continue to produce more bilingual faculty. Okay, so I'm going to skip this one. I'm just going to go to California. I'm going to. I'm going to. Um, so, just looking after Proposition um, uh, 227 pass, you look at the slope of there's a shortage of bilingual teachers. So now, right now, we're in a hurry to try to uh, develop some more um, bilingual teachers, prepare more bilingual teachers. And, and right now, this is, this, is, this is what's crazy, and we have to you know, talk about the cautionary note that Lupe Valdez told us about many years ago, and will tell us about it again, is that we cannot um, start these bilingual programs where we're getting so many calls from principals. We're ready to start a bilingual program. The community wants it. Um, and they don't even know where they're going to get their teachers. So, so they're starting these programs, and they're importing teachers, or they're, or they're just starting at kindergarten level, and they don't even know how they're going to continue to, to grow their program. So, so then with us, it's like, well, can we, can, you just, can we just hire them before you actually graduate them? No, we won't do that. Um, and our students understand that, because we say, you know, our students are too important that they need to have teachers that are well prepared, and they're ready to do a an efficacious job with students. So just real quickly, but what, what's happened now because of a limited pool, we have so many exams, we have so many, th uh, so many um, barriers that our students, uh, and, and money, you know, to take all these tests, um, that uh, a big part of my job has become preparing to teachers to pass a CSET. Um, a lot of our students uh, are not passing it. Right now, um, we have, it's 123 that just apply to our program for next year, but they're still trying to pass those tests. So, so we're just anyway. I won't get into that, but it's it's a barrier, and we need to uh, address that. And then, of course, the the CSET lote, then the the target language um, exam. So, as we look at all this, as a consequence of uh, Proposition 227, we have a lot of students that are coming into bilingual teacher education programs that that have different degrees of linguistic abilities. So here's just one quote from one of my students that I love to use because you know it was inspired by Gloria Saldua, but basically she says, I am a product of California 227, this lenguada, due to restrictive language policies. I lost my language, pero no perdí mi orgullo, de, el orgullo de mi cultura y mis raíces. Um, so as a result, I have worked hard to regain and reclaim my language, Espanol, in an effort to develop a high level of language and cultural efficacy to better serve my bilingual students. These are the majority of the students that, that are coming into our program right now. And they're, they're, they're coming with this, uh, these ganas to regain their, um, their language and their culture. So um, a colleague of mine, um, Ana Hernandez, uh, from the University of uh, San Marcos, uh, we have, because we are constantly interviewing you know, students that are coming in, and we've, we've come up with 25 typologies of the different types of uh, teachers that are coming in to our program, you know, the native English speaker that has acquired language through possibly a study abroad program, and then you have your native speakers that's, uh, that come from different Latin American countries, and then the bilingual speakers that maybe started in bilingual education and then were pulled out. So just real quickly on that. So what are we doing in institutions of higher education? So we are now looking at the fact that we are a standalone program. Um, we are 50% of our methods courses are taught in Spanish, the target language. So, um, you know, just um, amazing faculty that we're working with right now. 
And we are also offering an online dual language and uh, English language development certificate program because many of the teachers that are out there in the schools that were once bilingual teachers and were changed to English only programs and now they're like, okay, you're back, you're back to bilingual education, but they're saying, but I haven't taught or even looked at bilingual methodology in 20 years. So, so we developed this program to help them. Um, and um, what's, what's new and coming is we are this year, this fall, we're going to be launching a fully online bilingual teacher education program because guess what I found out? There are so many people in different outskirts, especially in migrant uh, communities that, that have students that have their BA and they want to be teachers but they have to work. So I opened it up. I haven't even developed the program. We're developing it this summer. 70, 70 students from all over the state uh, have applied for the online program. So it's going to really help to produce these teachers. Um, so we're spending this, these next few months just really developing the program in, in that area. Um, then we also, um, as, as we often hear that, you know, I do a lot of professional development for teachers, and then they say, but who's going to talk to our principal? Who's going to talk to our leader so that we can really implement this? So we are starting also this, uh, this fall a leadership and equity and access language uh, learners um, certificate program for principals and uh, for leaders that are in dual language education programs. And um, with the work with Patricia, we are also, we started a program with a binational teacher education because we have hundreds and thousands of students that we share with Baja California. So we are, we are also working in this area. So that's, that's the newer area and then and a PhD program with an emphasis in dual language education and then a, a movement that we have also working with right now is a national language teacher preparation standards so that we can begin to uh, look at what we're doing with teacher preparation nationally. Yay, I did it, okay. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, thank you so much for getting up so early and being with us today. I'm, I'm delighted to be part of this panel, part of these very strong women. I just love to be on an all-woman panel. It's really absolutely exciting. So um, my presentation today uh, is essentially calling uh, for the design of a research program that focuses on one type of bilingual education program, two-way immersion. And as you have heard this morning, we've actually gone through a number of ways in which we've talked about these programs. So these two-way immersion programs now involve students from two different groups of, of populations. Uh, mainly, they're coming at, with, with uh, different languages to acquire each other's languages. And so for a period of time, we called them dual language programs. Before we were using dual language, as, as Ophelia told us, to, be, to disguise the fact that they were bilingual education programs, right? So we've done a number of different things. So uh, my remarks are kind of oriented toward the future. Uh, and uh, they are probably a little bit different than what you have heard. So I want to call our attention to the children, and I st forgot to start my timer. So I'm gonna put my timer up here so that I can actually speed up where I need to. So, uh, so I wanna call attention to the children enrolled in these two-way immersion programs uh, and invite us to engage in a discussion of the language needs of those immigrant origin and African-American children who today attend residentially segregated schools. So I'm doing just a little bit different, and because uh, uh, what was wonderful about Oscar's invitation is that he said, talk about possibilities, right? So start with where we've been in the last 50 years and talk about where we're going forward in the next 50 years. So in, I'm in the next 50 years, the possibilities moving forward. So let me begin by saying that I've been very concerned about two-way immersion for a very long time. Remember when we first implemented two-way immersion, in some ways, we, because of all of the things that we've heard, we were very, very worried about whether or not we were going to survive. So one of the ways of surviving is selling it to the majority group and basically saying, yes, your child too can become bilingual. And we were trying very hard then to say, and if we do this, we'll get those pushy parents into the schools. And we know what pushy parents can accomplish. 
accomplish one. So there were a lot of reasons why we were inviting this. Besides the neoliberal streak that came much later, we really thought we could use these parents. But I worried about it, and you've heard a little bit about this cautionary note. In this cautionary note that I published some years ago, I actually said I was really very worried because I thought that we were giving away our language cheaply to the, lang to the children of the powerful. I got a lot of hate mail. Okay. I probably have not ever written anything that disturbed people as much as this particular article. I'm delighted that young scholars have rediscovered it and think that I said something important. But at the time that I wrote it, I suffered a great deal because I was really angry and I really thought that there was something that was wrong with this picture. That some, somehow the, the very fact of what Ophelia just captured was not exactly doing our children very good. They were, they were, they were getting ignored in the process. So, but I wrote another article in 2002, and this was a small little note. Uh, the International Journal of the Sociology of Language, then edited by Joshua Fishman, uh, published a, a particular uh, number in, in which uh, Eugene Garcia wrote about bilingual education, and very much taking, very much similar to what we've heard today, the history of bilingual education. And at that particular time, I really worried about that whole notion of enlarging the pie. And by enlarging the pie, I was really talking about information about the Ebonics controversy. I don't know if you remember Ebonics and the Ebonics controversy, but it took place in 1986 in Oakland, California. It's important because it built on the Ann Arbor decision, and some of you may remember the Ann Arbor decision, and it was the group of African American educators that brought forward a, a complaint that the needs of African American children were not being taken into account in the schools. And so the decision that was reached in the Zion Arbor decision basically said something you know, very neutral, which was that there was going to be professional development dedicated so that teachers would now understand the differences in the ways that children spoke. What's important about 1976, if you look at it and you juxtapose it with 1974, you'll see what, how much influence our community had on the whole notion that the children arrive in school with particular characteristics of their languages and that these matter in education. So they were really building on a lot of things that we had done. But the Oakland educators went a bit further, and they argued that African American children had unique language needs because they spoke Ebonics, a language other than English, right? So you'll notice here is coming in, really building on the Bilingual Education Act, on all of our work in which we had said, if you speak a different language, of course you have a right okay, to education, right? Now, unfortunately, okay, what's interesting is the Oakland educators sought to build on the efforts that, of course, that we had done, uh, beginning in 1968, and they claimed that black children also had a right to educational services that focused on the acquisition of standard English, and they proposed the implementation of bilingual, bicultural educations and language pedagogy. But the fundamental statement about the needs of African American children went unheard because debates about Ebonics took center stage. And I don't know if you can remember the debates about Ebonics, but everybody and his brother got into the picture, okay? So we had talk shows, we had all kinds of, of, of editorials, we had all kinds of, uh, of, of workshops uh, brought together all over the country. Uh, people said, oh, you're trying to teach these children a language that they already speak, and you know, the educators, in fact, they, they were really ultimately silenced because everyone did not want to appear that they were supporting the use of African African American varieties of English with English with, with African American children. So it all came to naught because the secretary, then Secretary of Education, said that in fact it was not a language, and therefore African American children did not have a right to bilingual education. But what's interesting is that in the broader in the broader discourse that we were engaged in at that time, we really didn't see the ties of what the Oakland educators were saying and doing to what we had done, because they were our triumphs, everything that we had established that they were laying claim to. So Geneva Smitherman, who was very, very central to the Ann Arbor decision, basically said the following, hopefully both the Latino community and my people, rather than fight over pieces of the present pie, will have the courage to struggle to enlarge the pie in the future so that all youth of color will be empowered with language and literacy skills. Important words. So today we're in a, in a different place. 
So young critical scholars, and I just really appreciate the young critical scholars enormously, because they're raising questions about inequalities in two-way immersion programs. And some of you may have seen this particular uh, contribution that appeared just a year ago by a group of young scholars that were actually talking about inequalities in two-way language immersion programs and to moving toward a critical consciousness, right? And so what's interesting about this particular, and it's a wonderful review of the literature if you're interested in, so they raise almost every question that you ever had about two-way immersion program. And then there are a group of other scholars who have also talked about, well, in foreign languages, we're not doing any better, right? So if you're looking at who enrolls in foreign language programs in this neoliberal kind of, yes, let's give children the gift of language, you're not really finding very many African-American children, and why not, right? And we need to worry about that, I believe. So if we worry about inclusion and social justice, and I think that almost everyone that has been this pioneer and this worker in, in the trenches in bilingual education has a deep commitment to social justice, not just about one group of children, but about all the children of color. And this is what brings us together, I think, for us. And so we, because we have these values, I'm also suggesting that there's a need for another cautionary note, right? And so I, I don't send me hate mail, though. So, <laughs> but, but at any rate, the, the cautionary note that might be, we need to remember that central to a social justice perspective is a commitment to the empowerment of all youth of color and to developing their very fine minds, which is, after all, the purpose of education, right? It is not for them to acquire English. And remember, at, at some point, Ronald Reagan told us, and the role of education is to teach these children English. And I thought, in all this time, I thought we wanted to educate them. You know, I just was so mistaken. So in any event, so. We need to be aware that in order to move forward to a more just society, the realities of racial prejudice and racial conflict between immigrants and African Americans must be discussed fully by bilingual educators and researchers before we continue to make statements about the value of two-way immersion programs for all children. So there are a lot of tensions and dilemmas when two programs include English-only students, that is EOs, who are middle-class white children, and African American children of working-class backgrounds. Uh, as Wise found in a study that she did in a, in a Bay Area, and I believe it's the Bay Area only because I know the researcher, but she actually studied a school, and I believe it's in the Bay Area, uh, and found that in, in this particular two-way immersion program, students were framed in ways that made distinctions that were based on racial and so socioeconomic lines. So some students were seen as ready to move into literacy, and other students were seen as already lacking some foundation in English literacy, and this was kindergarten. So at the school that Wise studied, a two-way immersion was modified because it needed to serve working class Latinos who tended to come to school without school-based literacy skills, or at least that is how they were seen by the educators. And there were middle and upper class Euro-American students who tended to come to school with school-based literacy skills. And there were working class African-American students whose literacy abilities apparently, according to the educators, mirrored the limitations of everything that Latinos were coming to school with. Right? So you see the dilemmas here, given our testing regime that surrounds us and the insecurities of teachers in that context. Right? So what we know is that African American students face real or perhaps only perceived language barriers and learning challenges, and this is very important. We also know that our views on language itself and on language are now in flux. And you've noticed that I'm picking up on Ophelia Garcia's languaging. Right? So she has contributed so much to what we're learning. So this affects what we do in classrooms and how we think about our goals for teaching both language and content. So I'm going to put up a cover here of a book. African American youngsters right now all around the country are being urged to code switch between AV and standard English. It's a way that African American educators have found to actually call attention to the fact that the ways that children speak are not the ways that others speak in this so-called academic language. I don't know what that is, but whatever it is, it's what those children don't have, right? So then they have to acquire something else, and they're encouraged to code switch, right? At the same time, we have Ophelia's work that in bilingual education spaces, we're not talking about translanguaging and reacting the very notion of code. Okay. 
And so perspectives on named languages. So we have here an incredibly interesting dilemma both as researchers and as theorists of how we want to think about this. So before we move forward to enlarging the pie, okay, and I'm all for enlarging the pie, I'm advocating that we do so, we need research that can help us determine whether two-way immersion as initially envisioned can address the needs of various groups of students and whether elements considered fundamental to two-way immersion can be modified. Okay. So what, what are those very things that we cannot do without and still call them two-way immersion, and what the effects of these modifications, if we modify them at all, will be on non-English background students of various types, students who are speakers of African-American varieties of English, and mainstream middle-class students raised with standardized English, and how our various theoretical perspectives on codes, named languages, and translanguages can inform the design of appropriate instruction. I think this is a very important and exciting moment in our lives, but we need to take those steps. So in reimagining the promises of the Bilingual Education Act, we will do well to remember the words of Garcia, who told us, and I should be stopping now, but I have three more minutes. What is evident from the research is that the use of the child's first language is most important in their long-term academic achievement and cognitive growth. We as bilingual educators can't be silent about whether and to what degree uh, two-way immersion programs can benefit African Americans. We just can't be silent about it. And as, future, as bilingual educators, we believe that we need to nurture and grow the resources that students come with from their homes and communities. How we manage the addition of these new resources to their repertoires is the key challenge that we must grapple with as we envision the inclusion of all students of color. Thank you. Thank you, Oscar, uh, for the invitation to be here with this fabulous group of women. I'm walking down memory lane with them, too. This is, <laughs> um, and also thank you for calling attention to the African-American situation uh, with respect to two-way. Um, at the Civil Rights Project, we have uh, long um, supported the idea of two-way as a desegregation tool of which we have very few left in our toolbox these days. And so that's another conversation we could have. Um, I'm going to talk about the economic value of bilingualism in the US, fearing that I might be moving into this neoliberal uh, area. But um, I have to tell you that this work began uh, in California as we, in the period of 227, but as we saw the possibility of going back to bilingual education on the horizon. So we published this, uh, this work a couple years ago, just as we were beginning to uh, discuss the possibility of undoing Prop 227. And I have to tell you, I was personally very involved very, very involved in the debates around Proposition 227 in California, going around the state arguing with Ron Unz, doing these debates. And the moment that it passed, I dedicated myself to the undoing of this. And this was part of the undoing of Proposition 227. So not intended to be neoliberal, Ophelia, but in fact, I live in a world of policy, of education policy. It's the work that I do. And so I think a lot about how it is we build constituencies for the kinds of education policies that we believe that we need. And of course, one of those constituencies is the parents who, of English-speaking children who want to learn another language as, as um, as was just noted, that this is one group of parents that we felt that we needed to get to. But I think we also have to face up to the fact that we have had a problem uh, convincing the Spanish-speaking and the Asian-speaking populations that they need, that, that their children needed these programs as well, bilingual programs. And too many times we heard parents say, I'll teach my child 
Spanish, Mandarin, Korean. You teach my child English. And so we knew that we needed evidence to work against that issue as well and to uh, broaden the constituency. So for those of you uh, who think, well, of course there is an economic value to bilingualism, um, all I can say is you haven't been reading the economics literature which <laughs> for decades has been telling us that it's not, that there really is, in our monolingual country, there really is no economic value to this. And for those of you who say, well, of course there isn't, because it's very racialized. Well, I have something else to, to report to you now. <laughs> so many studies have found that there is no economic benefit for bilingualism in the United States. But what I would call attention to, so when we began this work, we were sure uh, initially that we were going to find this economic value and this was going to be this great thing to help support the passage of Proposition 58 and to undo the ban on bilingual education. We were actually taken back a bit by just how consistent that research was that there was no benefit uh, and had to begin to interrogate those studies turned out that the data were inadequate to answer that question, really. Economists were using data that really had nothing to say about the uh, actual uh, proficiency in the, in the first language. The census data, which was used by almost all economists, just asked, do you speak another language? And that was all that we really knew. Um, we also understood that when you look at census data of people over time, you have different cohorts of individuals in there who are entering the labor force in very different periods. And in this very globalizing period in which our young people are now entering the economy, there are different uh, things that are operating. With better and with longitudinal data and with younger cohorts, we in fact find a bilingual advantage in the US labor market. And this ended up being very important for the way the authors of Proposition 58 in California structured that uh, initiative. So, um, in the uh, what we did in this work is we pulled together some of the best folks we could find out there in the world who had been doing work around the economics of uh, of language. And in this case, this is the work of Orhan Erdach, who is a uh, professor at the University of Leuven. He asked the question, which I thought was just wonderful, is there a cost to linguistic assimilation? So not is there uh, an, a, an economic advantage to bilingualism, but is there an actual cost to those individuals who might be bilingual? And what Orhan found was that, and these are like 2012 data now, okay, so you can up those numbers. Uh, but he found that there were balanced, balanced bilinguals, and I'm going to come to that in just a moment, a, a better definition, earned about $5,200 more annually at the beginning of their careers than do monolinguals. And this holds for various language groups not just Spanish speakers. Um, thus, there is a substantial loss to the individual. Those individuals who come from homes in which another language spoken actually lose money, lose earnings, as a result of losing their primary language. It's something we are taking away from these individuals, a competitive advantage. And so, and, of course, there's the loss of tax dollars that goes along with the loss in earnings. So Orhan states at the end of this piece that, in short, linguistic assimilation policies not only steal from people, but they steal from those who already have less in our society, making the social justice argument. Then we turn to Ruben Rumbao who has very interesting data on the economics of uh, bilingualism. And you probably can't see those numbers, and it doesn't matter because those are older data, and so the numbers actually don't matter. What matters here is kind of the bottom line. 
that the uh, Rumbaut found a number of uh, of things about the um, the benefits of bilingualism. But the important thing I want to point out here is that he found, as did others in this series of studies that we produced, that the more literate the individual was, the greater the uh, returns on bilingualism. So if you were highly biliterate, you were actually going to earn more money than if you just kind of sort of knew the language. This becomes very important to the arguments that we want to make about the uh, instruction of bilingualism. So does bilingualism affect educational attainment and therefore indirectly affect uh, how much you're going to earn once you're out into the world? So this work was done by Lucrecia Santibanez and Maria Estela Zarate, who uh, looked at US Department of Education data and found that Spanish bilinguals are more likely to enroll in college than English monolinguals all held equal. And here's a really critical one. The odds of going to a four-year college are higher for high use, in other words, literate, highly literate Spanish bilinguals relative to English monolinguals, clearly highlighting the bilingual advantage. We have known for quite some time that uh, one, that Latinos, Spanish-speaking Latinos, are less likely than any other subgroup to actually get a college degree. And we've also known that a major reason for that is because they tend to go to two-year colleges where they don't transfer. So anything that we do in our education system that, trans that helps to transfer these students directly into four-year colleges increases the probability of getting a degree and therefore it makes a huge impact on this group. So Santibanez and Zarate conclude that the pressure of linguistic assimilation reduces the chances to gain a college education, particularly for Latinos, and which would otherwise increase the, their value in the US labor market. We asked another question in this series of studies, do bilinguals have a hiring advantage? So we interviewed 289, almost 300 uh, human resources individuals across all sectors of the economy in California and outside of California. 56% of those almost 300 employers across all economic sectors said they would, quote, seek out bilinguals for at least some of their positions. The ones that were most likely to seek out these individuals were people in arts, entertainment, recreation, transportation and warehousing, retail, trade, healthcare, and social services, and educational services. Those that were least likely to seek out bilinguals were in management and technical services. Nonetheless, at least two-thirds, 66% of employers across all sectors of the economy said that they preferred to hire bilingual individuals all else being equal. So yes, there is a hiring advantage if you are bilingual. So do bilinguals have more opportunities for advancement? Between 63% and 80% of employers in transportation, manufacturing, construction, finance and real estate, arts and entertainment and education said there was greater opportunity for advancement for bilinguals. And it was very interesting because our interviewees often said, well, I'm not paid more. And a lot of people did not want to talk about this. That's why I'm not presenting the data here on who pays more, because they really did not want to discuss that on record. But well, many individuals said, I am not paid more. I earn more because I've been promoted more, as we saw earlier in terms of advancement and my job is more secure. We call this invisible compensation. To conclude, there are in fact significant benefits, especially to biliteracy, to biliteracy in education, earnings, and employment. And we thought this was terribly important to get this message across to parents that if you teach your child to speak uh, the home language at home, but do not educate them in the literacy of the language, you're really missing out 
on the important impact that that can have, especially for those younger employees entering the labor market in a more global economy, and for Latinos who go to four-year colleges at much higher rates. Transitional bilingual education, that kind of bilingual education that leaves behind the primary language is not the avenue to these benefits. The payoff comes from the maintenance of the home language and the development of literacy skills, which is what happens in dual language and bilingual, developmental bilingual programs. Thank you. So this has been a wonderful panel. I thank you, Oscar, for bringing us together. There's nothing more powerful than being with Latina professors who are bilingual and actually use it and have done it for many, many, many years. Um, with other, well, I can, yes, many years. <laughs> we are talking about 50 years, some of us who have lived it all. <laughs> um, what I'd like to talk to you today is about the Bilingual Research Journal. I have been honored and sometimes frustrated about being the co-editor for the last 10 years. My first co-editor was Kathy Escamilla. My current um, co-editor is Alba Ortiz. And the National Association of Bilingual Education is the sponsor. They exist as the professional education community um, in which the research has been documented since 1975. And so when I first was invited to this panel, Oscar said to me, uh, uh, you know, to do an abstract. And I said, okay, I can take the 10 years that I've been editor. And he says, oh no, do all 40. Um, and it's like, oh, who's gonna help me do this? And I wanna thank some people that helped me do this. Um, First, my colleagues at UT Austin, Cynthia Salinas, my colleagues at UT Rio Grande Valley, uh, Gilberto Lara, Maria Leja, uh, doctoral students at UT Austin, David de Goyado, Elizabeth Greer, Natalie Batista, Desiree Payais, Randy Bell, and Mitch Ingram. It takes a team, and I feel better working with a team, otherwise you would only have my perspective, so I thank them wholeheartedly. I worked on a Google Doc. These are like 80 some pages on the Google Doc because there are here 40 volumes anywhere from, from one issue to four issues, which is 120 to 150 articles that are documented in our Google Doc across states. Amazing. And printed it, printing it was also a, a challenge. So this organization um, is has the premier research journal. So what I'm presenting to you today is what we found within the journal itself. And one of the um, really important things is that in the very, from the very beginning, and I think because of the historical overview that you provided today, um, Dr. Garcia, it's like um, by cultural education is really was the emphasis because of that pride during an era that you were on the streets demanding those rights. So the cultural rights of what were the minority populations, the pride that had be inculcated in the beginning of the journal, you saw bicultural before bilingual. And to this day, UTSA, San Antonio, their department is bicultural, bilingual. I worked there for a while, but they still keep the fight going, that it isn't about language, because you can linguistically learn a different language. It's about the culture and in many ways the identity that you also are preserving. Um, Alma Florada was the first editor of the journal and she's on our board still today. And back in 1975, she said, we must be able to provide future generations with a command of their language and culture as adequate as the command we are demanding, they obtain of the dominant language and culture. And in that first issue, she also said, the journal will welcome contributions in all languages represented in bilingual programs in the United States. So that first journal had an article in Chinese, five articles in Spanish, and six in English. As an editor, I never have that many contributions today. So what has happened along the way? 
Um, it's wonderful to do historical overviews. It's amazing because the thinking at that time was symbolically represented in the languages chosen. Now, the material culture of classrooms, which is also something that is from an article in the 1980s used in anthropology about the symbolic nature of the things around you and what it does for your vision of your language, your culture, and your identity. And in that first, the, the volume three in the journal 1978-79, one of the documented quotes is, in spite of this apparent awareness on the part of teachers at the end of a study, um, one disturbing observation involved the sparse use of culturally relevant material in lessons. Now we talk about culturally relevant today as if in the 70s they didn't worry about those materials that they weren't trained to bring into the classroom as we have heard today. And this was equally true of both native Spanish speaking teachers and native English speaking teachers. In addition, even though most rooms were bilingual classrooms, very few wall visuals gave the outsider any indication of this. There was little evidence of native language or native cultural items on walls or blackboards in comparison to information on English American language and culture. And I've been in many schools where this is still true today. So culturally relevant curriculum, if, if you go through the Google Doc, you find all these different articles and this is only representative or the kinds of studies that were done under this rubric or the, under this theme, such as second language reading or uh, pre-service culturally relevant teaching, um, culturally relevant approaches to teaching Mayan because it isn't just about teaching Spanish, it's also about the the representative indigenous languages, if you're lucky enough to be able to have a bilingual program that would promote it. The engagement with picture books that are culturally relevant, which is an issue still today because it's mostly in English with a few words in Spanish. Um, hybrid language use um, while you're discussing, even if you've already been transitioned into an English-only environment. Um, culturally relevant pedagogy and social justice topics and leadership. Really important part is what are we doing to, for the principals and for the administrators to have a linguistically responsive school. So along those topics, I wanted to point out that um, one of our team members really got fascinated about Chinese because that first uh, issue had a Chinese article. And so we found that there's been two written in Chinese across the years, which isn't very much, but it really was important for us to consider what it would mean if we would get more manuscripts in other languages. But it isn't just Chinese. This is a huge group that we're talking about and variations in this group. So there's, it's just representative across the decades, like in the 70s, um, self-esteem and culture, relevant curricula, but for Chinese students, there were two articles, five on Indo-Chinese, but things like Chinese and Thai code switches, which is fascinating to use if you're going to be teaching about this at the university level. Um, language brokering among Chinese Americans and Vietnamese Americans, for instance. Um, the history of language policies of China, so that we would know then where the parents' perspectives come from. Or Chinese maintenance and shift and what that means in family identity. Uh, code mixing between Mandarin because there's not just one variation of Chinese. So these are the types of topics that are still coming up even into our era right now. My problem is getting the reviews to be culturally relevant, the reviewers to be fair in the, in the review of the manuscript. Um, you've heard today some of the discourse shifts from bilingual to dual to, we, we keep forward with language that really means something in how we represent it. Um, in 1994, this particular quote about how we went from leaving the limited English profession. And it's really a book review that this is written in um, regarding Genesee's book. And it says using the term limited English proficient is also unacceptable because as Genesee, Genesee claims, it implies deficiency in those children 
we know that, who live in language minority households and make substantial use of minority language. But this second part was really hit home for me, which is, therefore, the term LEP is likely to be associated with the deficit hypothesis, hypothesis which I knew. But I never looked at the other part, which assumes that the parents in some sociocultural groups fall short of the skills necessary to promote their children's academic success at school. So it's fascinating to know that through the decades, the work is about communities that we all care about, parent perspectives being one of them, who are the first teachers of the children. So these are some of the questions that appeared in a volume in 1999 by Lee. He asked, are parents aware of the goals and objectives of bilingual ed? I can't tell you how many times in, across the decades parents have been surveyed about their perspectives. Um, are parents cognizant of the different models and programs of bilingual education? My own students get confused about these models and what is the protocol for each of the models. Um, do parents believe their children should be taught in English and or in the home language. In other words, should they be instructed in a language other than English, and to what degree? And finally, do parents support or oppose bilingual education? Because the debate is ongoing. There's many English-only states to date. Um, but the ubi ubiquitous theme is assessment. It's everywhere. Assessment of research, assessment of teachers, assessment of students, and assessment of programs. Just amazing. Every, I, can, I don't think I can find any volume that doesn't have articles on assessments. So we are trying to live up to evidence-based, but we're also critiquing about what instruments we're using, how we're using them, for what purposes, who benefits from them. So I found that very interesting. Um, and a lot of it ends up in a sad note rather than a, an encouraging note. However, there are a few times where that's different. So for instance, performance-based assessments. Um, I love this because it's an important assessment for teachers to think about, both pre and in service. And in this particular um, issue in 1996, the authors found that perhaps the most important result of having a specially designed assessment for students in transition, which is the critical area, was the opportunity to break the cycle of failure and culture of discouragement when you get too many assessments, too many exams, over the school performance of language minority students. So that's a little bit more under the control of the instructor and less on the standardization that is expected of communities. And secondly, program models. How many have to keep fidelity to the program model, whether it fits in your community or doesn't fit in your community? So I loved finding this one, which is a model is just that. It is meant to be reshaped, retooled, and reframed based on the needs of students and the communities. Now, this is all controversial stuff, because we're living and being funded under different kinds of guidelines. But it's great to know it's not my opinion, although I may be leaning toward it, um, to find the substance within the research that has been spoken through in the last 40 volumes. Um, there is a special issue, and it was dedicated to an editor of the Bilingual Research Journal, Richard Ruiz. And he wrote in 1996, as a need for minority children to receive quality education unimpaired by their language ability gains recognition, and as the right of all human beings to grow and expand within their own cultural roots begins to gain acceptance and becomes the reason for more bilingual bicultural education programs in the United States, it seems necessary to provide an organ of communication to educators in this field, the organ being the National Association of Bilingual Ed, who has gone through great ups and downs and has finally been revitalized and starting on its way up again. So I loved finding this dedication that he made in his editorial. Um, this is about a special issue that we dedicated to Richard because even though he talked about the United States, Really, he wrote a lot in the international domain and contributed a lot with his language planning uh, theoretical framework. And so the issue called for uh, a double issue, actually, because of the number of manuscripts. And Dr. Escamilla was a co-author with me, and Dr. Veronica Valdez, who is also here in the audience. And this, I pointed out, because themed issues, some of our illustrious 
panel here have also been editors of themed issues. And themed issues are the ones that are most cited in the bilingual research journal. This one right now has at least three of the 11 articles that are, have the biggest click and download uh, currently. So I, I point that out because um, it, 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 other it's not just the editor, the editor brings in other people in order to make the strongest theme that will be everlasting. And when I say click download, it's globally, not just locally. Um, see, th these are some of the genres, and the reason I point this is I really wanted to know across the years. I'll tell you, research was not written about, you didn't have as many citations following sentences in 1970 <laughs> as you do today. And so that's been, it really looks more like an essay. It looks more like a position paper. And we didn't know how to code it. So we have editorials, essays, literature reviews, position statements, bibliographies, book reviews. Um, and I'm talking book reviews of picture books as well as research books. Reports, poems, interviews, speeches, annotations, concept papers, critiques, autobiographies, which we would probably call an autoethnography today, um, all represented across the 43 years that we've taken on. And I love this because the themed issue for Richard had letters at the end of it from his students, from his colleagues, from a family member. And that is, you know, I, I felt like, can I do this in a research journal? And I have now evidence, of course you can. And last year at AERA, six SIGs got together and they invited Carmen Tafoya, the poet laureate of San Antonio and Texas, um, to give a talk, which he did. It was really a performance you can find on video to Baba Tere, a little child in a bilingual classroom. And um, so I said, can I have your essay? And she gave it to us, and so it's in volume 39. And then I said, I wanted audience, people like you, to give responses to what she said. And I got them, and it's beautiful. Some of them wrote a poem for the first time in response to her performance. So I wanna let you know it's a research journal, but why have we favored only particular ways of communicating with those who are passionate about social justice and bilingual education. So the necessity as we move forward, I can't tell you, we need articles on special education, the overrepresentation of children who come from families who do not speak English in special education continues to this day. And whenever I have an article that is the intersection uh, in, intersectionality of special education and other needs in a family, that has got a humongous click and download um, perspective. These are some of the ones that you can find in the journal today. American Sign Language is a heritage language, deaf student access to bilingual education, referral to special services, student access to least restrictive environments so that they're not segregated all day long, uh, parental roles and perspectives regarding their child's education, English instruction for Latino Spanish heritage speakers and preparation of teachers, not just the ones that are special ed teachers, the ones that are going to be in part of the least restrictive environment. The other real necessity is indigenous education. There's a special themed issue uh, that was done by Teresa McCarty and Ophelia Cepeda. Um, but we need another one. Now I realize that since they wrote this in 1995, that there are now journals that are just for indigenous scholars. On the other hand, we need to intersect, collaborate a little bit more. These are some of the language groups that, have been, that were talked about in that particular one, which is fascinating to me. Finally, what are the possibilities? I'm gonna return back to what Alma Florada said in the very special first issue, which is we must be able to provide future generations with a command of their language and their culture as adequate as the command. We are demanding, and really we need as citizens, to obtain of the dominant language and culture. Thank you. Just lining up. Okay. <laughs> Did you want to be on? Oh. Could you please? Oh. 
Could you please join me in giving them another round of applause, everyone? Thank you all for uh, sitting through the long presentation, but I also want to thank the presenters for making it as enjoyable as it can be uh, in terms of engaging us in really rigorous thought and research. Um, now it's time for the Q&A. So the way that this is going to work is that we have a couple of hot mics uh, right in the middle. So if you need to stretch out and you still have a burning question, uh, this is a perfect combination of moving around and asking a question to one of these leading scholars. Um, so feel free to sort of get up and, and form a line uh, at those hot mics. Um, when you do so, um, please target, because we do have a large panel, target your question to one particular panelist. I know it's very difficult. Um, and then we'll have the panelists, one or two of you, to sort of uh, follow up on that initial comment. Um, so that way we can try to get it to as many questions as we can, okay? So um, we'll go ahead and, and start the, the Q&A. No se intimiden. Good morning. Um, my name is Eva. I'm actually a professional in the field, but more than anything else at this moment, I'm talking to you as a parent. Um, I was professionally trained here. I don't have a question for a particular person, so I'm breaking the rule. Um, and I left the country for several years, for over a decade. And my children are currently English learners in the system. So I'm having a, quite an experience looking at these issues. Um, as a professional, as a parent. So my question to you is, um, parent roles, parent perspectives, we know that we are key in advocacy. Even with all the knowledge that I may have, I find myself in a terrifying situation because I know that my next step is the Office of Civil Rights. And although I can build community support in a way, locally. I think at this moment, as a professional and as a parent, I need the support of influential people in the field because this is not something that is only my issue or my child's issue or my local issue. So I'm calling you to see what your advice is at this moment in terms of the kind of support that you can provide parents like me to go through this challenge of jumping and making that complaint to the Office of Civil Rights. I'll reference that to whoever wants to jump in, but civil rights, and I'm thinking of Patricia, of course, uh, but anyone. So yeah, one, one initial comment and two follow-ups if needed. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, we don't understand what the complaint is. Um, my child is currently an English learner in a, an educational environment that is full of inequities, and we know that that is not just the exception, that is more the rule. So right now, as a leader, what is it that you can do for people like me that want to find a way to support a complaint to the Office of Civil Rights. I know the evidence is there. Now it is required by the current um, legislation in education. But so, edu you know, evidence is, doesn't seem to be enough. So maybe the process, sort of more of a, what would, how would, what would you recommend in terms of, if you're seeing that civil rights are being violated, what should a parent or any of us do? Well, I, I guess I would say to you that the first thing is to take it to your district so that you have evidence that you have attempted to make them aware of the problems and uh, have not been satisfied with that. But then you, as an individual, can make the complaint to the Office for Civil Rights in the Department of Education. And uh, they, if, they, if you can help build the evidence for the problem, they uh, will attempt to, well. 
Well, the thing it's, is, it's not. We're not clear on this right now in I terms know. of this administration. But um, I think that's the terrifying wrong. part. The evidence is there. We have all the statistics, and I know what I can do. I know what how to submit a complaint. Uh -huh. The issue is that this is a very lonely trip. And, yes. and I want the community support, not the local community, I want the national community to, to help in this process. Is there any way, you know, or there is no way? I, I don't know what to tell you, but I know that the only thing that, that works and that has been destroyed is the possibility of community organizing. Yeah. And you can, you can file as an individual, but you have to have had, have had done the, the groundwork uh, you can ask for support from, you know, scholars, but what really is going to work is the community swell up. But it's, it's, uh, this is part of what I think has been the problem, that we have disconnected from communities. What state are you in? Arkansas. Who? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are an English-only state. And I think what has been most terrifying in the process is that we're constantly dismissed as parents in terms of bringing out these issues. And right now, because my children are in the system, I am terrified of retaliation, not against me, but against them. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. um, I'm sorry if this is not the right place to do this, but I thought that out there, we talk a lot about parent engagement, yeah. and here we are trying, but we find that it's th something else has to happen beyond us, and sometimes even our local little efforts. Thank you for, I think this is, um, my suggestion would be, the panelists will be here, it's an ongoing conversation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for bringing up the issue. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here and see a lot of uh, distinguished professors who inspired me a lot in my field. My name is Fu Biao. I'm from Texas A&M University. Currently, I'm a first year PhD student in bilingual education. Here, I would like to ask a question for Dr. Casey Escamilla. <coughs> Uh, recently, I talked with my advisor. Uh, he he told me that uh, in recent articles, uh, uh, currently the English learners, the uh, term English learners is start to replace the term English language learners. So my question is very straight and short. What would, you, what would you think about this change? What do you think about the difference between English learners and English language learners? And can you please clarify a little bit about it? Thank you so much. Well, thank you, and I don't know that I ever recommended that change, or I don't, uh, I, I, I more favor a term called emerging bilinguals, mm -hmm. or something with bilingual in the term, yeah. but there's no question that um, over the last 50 years, as we reminisce, we have gone through iterations of, how, of various kinds of nomenclature. What do we call, how do we label, and while I see, um, particularly from the civil rights viewpoint, some utility in that. It has also cost us in the way that we cast these deficit notions about kids. And so something that's a little bit more uplifting, more positive, and I would certainly invite uh, my colleagues on the panel, um, that with the term bilingual that, that speaks to a potential and not a perceived deficit is probably um, more likely where we want to go to see a more positive future. I'd like to comment on that, though, too, because I've been very aware of, uh, particularly Ophelia, I think, has been pushing the notion of emergent bilinguals. But I have very purposefully not used that term in a California context because we are not doing that. We're creating monolinguals. Yeah. And I just felt like this is like giving away something to folks who are really not providing that. Now that we are in a new era, I'm, I am really thinking long and hard about this issue of what we call them because I think as long as we continue to call these children by a term that indicates what they don't have as opposed to what they do have, we are complicit 
in, uh, in this deficit notion. So I, th I think it's really time for us to rethink how we can reference these young people uh, in a more positive, assets-based way. And I would like to add to that. I'm now recently calling these students, uh, students bureaucratically categorized as English language learners. <laughs> <laughs> Because this basically that tells takes a lot of room. On it. it takes a lot of room, but I insist on it when I write because I really want to lay the blame where the blame should be. Right. So either I'm using now multi-competent students, or I'm using the whole long term of English of, of children bureaucratically categorized. And I typically go on to another class that, as we know, are a heterogeneous group. Right. Because what I want to push is the heterogeneity of this particular label. Yeah. yeah. Nice. That's but, but just to make, uh, uh, just to clarify your question, because you wanted to know about the shift of English language learners officially to now English learners, that is a term that was picked up by ESSA. Yeah. So yes. yeah. that's when the shift occurred. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm Maria Timmons Flores. I'm a professor of ELL and bilingual education at Western Washington University. And I'm currently working as part of a state working group looking at trying to eliminate the standardized tests as a barrier to access for bilingual teachers, future bilingual teachers, and teachers of color. And I've had a really difficult time finding um, research or literature um, about others in the country who are doing that work. So as a question to the panel, I'm sort of selfishly asking if you know of people who are currently doing this work nationally to push back against the standardized tests, and if not, if you had ideas that could help us in terms of going to a very conservative legislature and trying to make that argument. Well, I can recommend the, the uh, work of Kate Minkin in New York State especially. You're talking about assessment for teachers. Yes, for teacher what? assessment, for standardized teacher tests. Assessment. I mean, if yeah. you look at it on so many levels, whether it's the, yeah. the deficit orientation it cultivates when they don't pass the test and reasons that we all understand why they wouldn't, the costs that are involved, um, the stigmatization, and really the fact that they are absolutely a, not a representation of what our future teachers know and can do. So, so I'm, I have similar concerns, and what I'd like to do is why don't we talk afterwards, because I don't know of a movement, but let's start it. Okay. Because yeah. I, I agree yeah. with you, it's, it's a, a huge barrier, and it has no bearing on how well teachers are going to be able to teach Thank bilingual. You, I think it is something that really needs to be supported. Probably. Right, okay, so let's talk afterwards. Hi, uh, my name is Marion Bott. I'm with the New York State League of Women Voters, and I'm our education finance uh, pro bono lobbyist in Albany. Uh, my question is, depending upon which one of you thinks uh, they have the most expertise, uh, the role of technology in light of what you've so well outlined in terms of the lack of um, bilingual educators. <laughs> Uh, what is your assessment of uh, substituting, if you will, the machine for the person? Oh, this is for you. I've seen this uh, in uh, presentations by Microsoft, uh, other private vendors where, look, this is easy, I just take my cell phone and I <laughs> translate. Uh, it may not be perfect, but the question is, uh, from the financial point of view, it seems to some people to make sense to substitute a machine for a person. So be interested in your views. Thank you. So, so I'll, I'll respond to that with respect to bilingual teacher preparation. Um, personally, I'm, I'm very traditional in the sense that I love the face-to-face. -face. I think that, you know, just building that relationship and, you know, all those things that go with it is, is really important. But I think that, you know, as I shared earlier, earlier we, we now start, we're starting a fully online bilingual teacher preparation. That's in addition to our face-to-face. -face. And so we're considering all that is how are we going to actually do this? But the, the, the reality is that in order for us to have a, a reach, a further reach, then we need to be able to do that. And also there, there are some amazing programs that have, uh, I'm still learning about it myself, that really are able to um, help teachers 
get get this interaction that you would get in a face-to-face. -face. You know, again, you can't substitute it, but I think that we can come very close to it. And it's more about what's going to be involved, what's going to be embedded in the curriculum that matters, and looking at those uh, this ideologies that that um, are going to inform what we want our teachers to to know and do. I just want to add that context makes all the difference. Technology doesn't stand there alone, and it's not meant, I think, just to replace people. So I'll give you an example. In special education, it's a mediation. It's not a replacement of. So I think contextually, it just depends um, what the purpose of, of technology is and who benefits and how they benefit from it. I think in a similar fashion, I just wanted to add that I, I think we need to think also in terms of hybrid programs, where part of it is presencial, in person, face to face, and part of it where we can use the technology to support that is a, is a good way to think about it. That makes more sense. The, re the research should be there to support that. Yes. that uh, it's a new area. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I think we're at the time, aren't we? There's time. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, we have 10 more minutes. Oh, we do? Oh. oh. It goes to 10.30? Mm -hmm. oh, it was 10.30. Two hour session. Started at 8.15. <laughs> 8.15. I'm just saying. Yeah. All right, we'll have one last question. You're right. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, my last question, sorry. AJ Shrikant, I'm a PhD student at Rutgers University. My question is for Oscar and Patricia. Emerging bilinguals that seem to be embedded in states with highly inequitable school finance policies with inequitable state uh, funding formulas and that don't really seem to provide adequate funding. They don't even seem to be trying in terms of both fiscal effort and level. So my question is, how do you think school finance policies can evolve to account for emerging bilinguals' needs? Okay. Uh, I'll let Patricia. Okay. Um, so in California right now, we are going through this because um, our funding formula in California has been changed to what's called the local control funding formula. And it designates three groups of children who are supposed to get additional funding um, because of an acknowledgement of their uh, additional needs. One of those groups is English learners. And there's an additional concentration funding if uh, if they rise to, I think, 55% of the children in the school, the school is supposed to get additional funds. So this is groundbreaking in the sense that it acknowledges the needs of these children above and beyond the regular funding. The problem that we're having now is defining what people are actually doing with those funds and if they are actually going to these kids and if they are using research-based kinds of um, innovations to work with these kids and that's a big debate going on in the state right now. So the first step has been made and I think that's, uh, we're writing about this right now. Uh, Oscar is, uh, is overseeing a, a, an issue in which uh, we're really talking about the potential uh, for this model to make a real breakthrough in the funding for English learners. I, I would just add that Funding for English learners, ELLs, or emergent bilinguals, whatever term we want to use, and states use, right? There's differences among states in terms of some use bilinguals, some use ELLs, some use ELs. However, regardless of the state, no state is actually using empirical evidence to create their funding mechanism. Even California, who has revamped their mechanism, they it's a political compromise in terms of what is negotiated in terms of the funding. And there's great discrepancy be amongst, uh, across the states. So some states, like Alabama, doesn't fund at all. They may have recently changed, but they didn't provide any funding. Um, Arizona provided a 6% bump. Um, uh, Florida provides 200% more, a double amount. Um, so, so the that's the first thing that we need to address, is that there's no coherence between what is actually needed to properly fund and what type of program. Are we talking about an ESL program? Are we talking about an ELD program? Are we talking about a dual language or two-way immersion program? All of these have different costs. 
Uh, uh, lastly, um, tomorrow, I believe it's tomorrow because I, I forgot the time today, uh, but I think <laughs> tomorrow um, I'm going to be on a panel that talks about the Martinez v. New Mexico case. And what I propose is a contextualized district-based model to fund English learners, and I'll be presenting that tomorrow. Okay. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>